Ball pythons are semi-arboreal and don't just live underground like some keepers want you to believe. So yes, ball pythons are semi-arboreal. A species many confined to a rack are semi-arboreal. How can I even make this claim when so many say ball pythons live underground? Am I going to prove it? Yes, yes I am. And I can prove it with science. And I can prove it with dozens upon dozens of images of keepers allowing their ball pythons to climb and express the behaviours they evolved to express. But before we get into this, I just want to lay some things out for everyone. If you're wondering why you've only ever seen a ball python kept in a rack, well that's because 9 times out of 10, people are only exposing themselves to other keepers. Keeping in that way, if you join a Facebook group that only keeps in racks, then that's all you're going to see. That being said, part of the harvest for photo evidence for this video, I downloaded 100 images of ball pythons climbing and expressing natural behaviours to really drive the point home. When I am not discussing literature, I will show images provided by hobbyists. For now, let's really focus on the scientific facts and literature. First of all, let's start with this paper on the diet of ball pythons in the wild. This study analysed the diets of wild ball pythons by examining faeces or forcing regurgitation of stomach contents. This study was done over two years and ball pythons were found in trees. Not only were they found in trees, but the study was conducted from 8am to 6pm. So during the day, 49 out of 87 ball pythons surveyed were found in trees. This study found that snakes smaller than 70 centimeters, or just over two foot, almost exclusively fed on small birds, i.e. nestlings or immature birds. Both sexes exclusively fed on birds and small mammals, with a significant difference between the sexes. Birds made up to 70.2% of a male's diet, and on the flip side, females' diets were made up of 66.7% mammals. When individuals over 100 centimeters are concerned, the diet is almost exclusively small mammals. And even then, it consisted of arboreal species as well, like bush babies, bats, and giant forest squirrels. Now I can go into the detail on what they specifically ate, but I've gone through that in absolute detail in another video I made. But to summarize, the birds they were eating weren't ground dwelling birds by any means. No, they were African gray parrot juveniles, because presumably, They've been nest raiding, they were starlings, there were thrushes, there were warblers, there were pigeons and doves. They even ate multiple different species of bats. And what's really interesting is the fact that ground nesting species do exist within the ball pythons range. And in fact, there's multiple species of ground nesting birds that not only breed in that range, but breed in multiple different seasons. And that's why African egg eaters evolved to even make use of this prey resource. So ground nesting species like plovers, barbets and dickops would almost certainly be available to raw pythons, yet they do not appear among the prey lists. So what do the vast majority of these prey species have in common? They're either arboreal or fly. Meaning, the bull pythons are in arboreal positions to catch them. I know what some people will say, and try and come up with excuses. Oh, they must have eaten those birds when they came to the ground. Well, African grey parrots do not nest on the ground, and bats don't go to the ground. So presumably, they're either in ambush positions in trees to snag a meal out of mid-air, or they are actively foraging and sneaking up on roosting bats and raiding birds' nests. Plus, the paper stated, ball pythons up to 70 centimeters almost exclusively fed on immature and nestling birds. And where are these birds? Up a tree. So when people say bull pythons live in termite mounds all year round, well, how do nestling parrots and other birds, bats, giant forest squirrels and bush babies end up on a termite mound? The answer is they don't. Bull pythons go out hunting and are climbing to do so. Outside of the argument of semi-arboreality, the fact that bull pythons only eat birds up until two foot long may explain why they can be hard to get feeding initially, because they evolved to take avian prey, and keepers in captivity are trying to force rodents upon them. And if that wasn't enough to convince you, another study on snake diets in another location also had bull pythons included and found similar results. 
Birds and arboreal mammals make up a significant percentage of a ball python's diet. Another thing that I want to point out here is that Dendropikos are woodpeckers and Cystocola are warblers. Neither of these genera spend much time, if any, on ground level. Is that not enough? Okay, next paper. Why do male and female python regis differ in ectoparasite load? Now at this point it's important to stress that this paper was done in Togo and not Nigeria. This isn't a localised phenomenon. Semiaboreality is being documented across the whole of the ball pythons range. This study points out that males carry different parasites and at a different load than females, proposing that parasite loads differ because of different space usage. Males being more arboreal than females are collecting ticks from tree branches as well as terrestrial ticks that the females typically get. So now, semi-arboreality in bull pythons has been identified in Togo and Nigeria. This personal account from Sudan by Charles Sweeney was documented in 1969. Now it's a very old document. I'm assuming this has been scanned, so it's a little bit blurry. It may be hard to read, so I'm gonna read it to you. It was not until I returned to my camp that I saw a royal python about 10 feet high in a tree. It's four foot length, was half hidden in a hole in the trunk. I waited and watched nearby. In a few moments, the reptile emerged from the hole, pulling the forepart of the body out by wrapping its tail around a branch. I expected it to have caught some prey, but apparently it had found nothing in the hole. Next, the python moved slowly to the end of the branch before turning back to the main trunk where it paused for a moment, then moved to a higher branch. Here there was another hole which it inserted its head but again, it found nothing. By this tedious process, the snake investigated most of the tree, spending almost half an hour from, from the time I came upon it, but without finding any supper. If this was its usual method of finding its prey, then there must have been many nights when the python went hungry, and it was just as well for the animal that it could live without eating for months. The snake came close to the ground, lowering its length, until suspended by only the prehensile tail. It dropped the last few inches. I would have liked to see what it would do next as it moved ponderously over the ground, but I was tired. It was now early morning and I was afraid I might lose the python amongst the rocks or in a hole, so I picked it up. It made no protest and remained quite passive when draped around my neck, this being quite the easiest way to carry it, although it required to be adjusted occasionally when it moved. So you can see here, Arboreal tendencies in bull pythons have been seen in Sudan as well. So what we're seeing here is this covers the vast majority of the bull pythons range. This is not an isolated incident by any means. And in this paper, survey of the status and management of royal pythons in Ghana. They describe trackers following tracks all the way back to a burrow. It's a bit strange that there's tracks to follow back to a burrow if the snake never leaves, isn't it? Another thing to point out was that this paper explicitly states that the survey was restricted to certain areas of farmland, as this is where local hunters have greatest ease in finding them, i.e. in an area with fewer trees. Of course, this paper is describing the use of burrows and termite mounds. No one is denying that. What I and others take issue with is that some keepers acknowledge this fact that they utilise burrows and termite mounds and just latch onto this and propose that a bull python never leaves a burrow, when we know that isn't correct. This paper describes trackers looking for burrows to find bull pythons. Well, if you're looking for bull pythons in burrows, the only place you're going to find them is in burrows. The bull python spend the dry season estivating, just like temperate snakes spend their winter brumating. Notice how we don't use the conditions they experience during their dormant period to define what their captive care should look like. Outside of the scientific literature, Look at these pictures. Yes, I know some are not climbing at great heights, but the snakes are making use of what the owners can afford to offer them, and the owner is making effort to offer climbing opportunities. I downloaded 100 images of bull pythons climbing to show that not only does science indicate they're semi-arboreal, but keepers are finding this out for themselves. This is not something exclusive to wild bull pythons. Science has proven they eat birds in the wild, and look at these images. Do you notice this behaviour? It's the same arboreal ambus position adopted by green tree pythons. They're expressing the same behavioural arboreal adaptations to catching flying prey as green pythons do. And again, look at the way these bull pythons are resting. 
they're expressing the same behavioural arboreal adaptations to resting in trees, just like green pythons do. They can even prefer to eat prey offered from below, just like green pythons do. Are you starting to see it now? These are semi-arboreal animals. As anyone who has ever seen one of my videos before, would have seen me state the UK's Animal Welfare Act and the five needs. Well, within it, it states the need for a suitable environment. Well, if a big part of a bull python's natural history is actually semi-arboreality, then shoving a bull python in a rack fails this. Then there's the need to be able to express normal behaviour patterns. Well, again, if a part of the species' natural behaviour is semi-arboreality and climbing, then a rack fails this yet again. Besides the fact of climbing, a rack excludes any ability to express normal behaviour. The bull python just sits there. The only behaviours we can really say a bull python can express in a rack is pooing and eating, which happens when? Every once a week for a juvenile at the most? Bearing in mind that the literature now criticises the Animal Welfare Act for only meeting the very basic needs of an animal, and that it doesn't achieve good or even great welfare, then arguably a bull python in a rack isn't even having its basic welfare needs met. At what point do we as a hobby wake up and realise that this is not okay? People eye roll at people comparing racks to puppy mills, and you know what? Both of those two scenarios fall short of basic welfare requirements, so I'd say they're right to compare the two. Now I can see the point of racks used in temporary situations like quarantine or in a shop where an animal will be sold and then hopefully be housed appropriately after. The issue I have is this, big breeders limit welfare to prioritise money. Fair enough, no argument anyone makes regarding welfare will change that. But for you to tell people that the conditions you keep your animals in to maximise profit is what they should keep their animals like at home, is just wrong. This is exactly how misinformation and myths in the hobby spread. I'm not saying that bull pythons aren't secretive and shouldn't have ample hiding opportunities, hence why they can be found in rodent burrows and termite mounds, but they're also found in trees. So if you strongly believe they should have burrow-like conditions in captivity because they do so in the wild, then surely you should also strongly believe that they should have climbing conditions in captivity like they do so in the wild. I really hope this video reveals reality to some people. It's a reality the hobby needs to know. So share this video absolutely everywhere. Even in those groups that swear by racking systems. Yes, you're going to get those people that disregard it because it doesn't fit their narrative. But it may also find those people that generally want to do the best for their animal, but just don't know that this information is available. I always want to contribute to the hobby and have a positive impact on welfare. But I also want this to be an effort by every keeper. Add even more anecdotal evidence to this video by leaving a comment about what your ball python does and its semi-arboreal tendencies.